So uh, today's master therapist is Dave Mikulitz, and um, he has actually prompted the third definition of a master therapist. You remember that when we started off with Andy Christensen, I gave um, uh, my first definition of a master therapist, which involved uh, certain cognitive and intellectual skills and wisdom, so a cognitive dimension and then heart, compassion, empathy, a more emotional component, and then finally, the ability to use those skills to build something in a sustained fashion over time. And I think that applies to all the therapists you know, that we're gonna have the privilege to listen to. And then in week two, I had a second definition uh, with Colleen Kelly, does anybody remember what that definition was? No? It was a therapist that a therapist would be willing to refer a family member or loved one to, which is a, a major compliment, I think, of somebody's uh, competency. So uh, Dave's prompted the third definition of a master therapist, which is someone whose accomplishments are so extensive that I could not commit them to memory I had to write them down, okay? That's the, the third definition. So uh, here it is, a reflection of my memory uh, um, limitations or, and or Dave's uh, amazing accomplishments. So Dave Mikulitz is a professor of psychiatry in the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at the UCLA Semmel Institute. Do you want to say a minute, uh, talk about Semmel Institute so they know what that is, what it's about? Yeah, uh, the Semmel Institute is essentially the Department of Psychiatry. Uh, there are a few neurologists in there as well, but it's mainly psychiatrists and psychologists. Okay. Um, and then in addition um, to that affiliation, uh, Dave is also a clinical research fellow at Oxford University. How did that come about? You're a little that far from there. Yeah. yeah. I uh, went there on a sabbatical in 2006, and uh, I stayed there for a year. I did some collaborative research, uh, learned mindfulness while I was there, mm -hmm. and uh, they offered me a chance to keep coming back on a regular basis. And have you? And I have been. I've been going uh, twice a year. Oh, wow. On average. Continuing to do free research there? Mm hmm Okay. It's been great. Um, so his area of specialization, his area of research, is, is family factors and family psychoeducational treatments for both adult onset and child onset bipolar disorder. Um, he has published over 250 uh, research articles uh, and, and, and some number of books too. Um, in terms of his books, he's a co-author with um, Michael Goldstein, a long time professor from, from UCLA, um, uh, in a book called Bipolar Disorder, A Family-Focused Treatment Approach. And it won the outstanding research publication from the American Association of Marriage and Family Therapy. Um, then he um, is also the sole author of the Bipolar Disorder Survival Guide, which is an international uh, bestseller, and he came bearing gifts. So he gave me a signed copy of, of this book, and uh, I'm sure it's amazingly uh, useful if any of you have any interest in the more clinical aspects. Uh, and this is written, I assumed, for a general educated audience, such as the people here. Okay, so um, thank you for that, Dave. And then lastly, uh, your most recent book with Mike Gitlin um, is called A Clinician's Guide to Bipolar Disorder, Integrating Psychopharmacology and Psychotherapy. And we'll talk about that, that integration today. Okay, how did you, um, one of the things we usually do when we start off is just to um, uh, give us a sense of how you came to study mood disorders and bipolar um, disorders 
uh, in particular? What drew you to this area of study and treatment? Sure. Well, first, thanks for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. To see you again as yeah, well. Yeah, right. Thank you. We palled around in graduate school quite a bit. Right. How was that? 1930? Last year. Something? Last year, <laughs> <laughs> um, So. But remember, I couldn't remember your credentials. <laughs> So uh, I got interested in psychology in high school, and uh, I read Freud when I was in high school. I got very excited by it, um, and I knew pretty much early on that that's what I wanted to do, although what I wanted to do in psychology was a mystery. I went to college. I got my first experiences with research, primarily in schizophrenia. Um, when I went to graduate school, I continued to work with uh, schizophrenic patients, actually the gentleman that uh, Rich mentioned Michael Goldstein uh, worked primarily with schizophrenia and families and how families interact and what the family has to do with the course of schizophrenia. I got interested in bipolar disorder really from two uh, angles. One was I started doing a practicum or really an internship at UCLA Medical Center and I was put in charge of a group for bipolar patients which I learned a lot from. I was very impressed with the group itself because the patients who were in there uh, were a lot more helpful to each other than we were as therapists. They had gone through episodes. They knew how to cue each other. Uh, hey, you're starting to sound manic. This is what you should do. This is the doctor you should call. You should do this. Try this medication. So I got interested just in the whole uh, sort of psychology of bipolar disorder. And it was at a time when uh, everybody was talking only about genetics and medicines. That it was inherited, that you should take lithium, and that was really what was known about it at the time. So there was a real opening for someone interested in looking at psychosocial factors and therapy and whether therapy added anything to medications. So that really became my career, was to uh, develop treatments for families who had a bipolar member, usually a, an adult, who had to say he was living with mom and dad, and mom and dad didn't know anything about the disorder, but needed to know something. How do we encourage them to communicate better, understand the illness, understand when someone is getting ill again, what the early warning signs are, uh, and what do we know about the families themselves? How do they differ from families that have other disorders like schizophrenia? And that's really where my, uh, I'm leaving, leaving off a lot of things that happened along the way, but that's been my emphasis. Right. So we're going to focus uh, mainly on the uh, bipolar aspect, sure. uh, excuse me, the manic aspect of the bipolar um, uh, disorder. But even before we get into that specificity, it's embedded within the area of mood disorders in general. So maybe you can just mention uh, to the group, uh, what are the major categories of mood disorders, a family of mood disorders of which bipolar is embedded? Sure. So we usually think of mood disorders as having a bipolar and a unipolar form. When we talk about unipolar depression, we're talking about people who vary between feeling okay and feeling severely depressed. And they cycle back and forth. They may go back to a normal state and then have another episode of depression, or they may have a period of time in between episodes where they're still depressed. We call that dysthymia. Uh, or we used to call it dysthymia, now we call it persistent depressive disorder. Uh, in bipolar disorder, people vary usually between severe depressions and either what we call manias, where they're really uh, highly charged up, active, thinking very uh, fast, having uh, grandiose delusions or thoughts, not sleeping at all, uh, and being dysfunctional, uh, getting called in by the police or arrested or getting in traffic accidents. Or some people only go to what we call hypomania, where they have all those same features, but it's not impairing. You might see it, you might, the person might come across as being activated and kind of on top of the world, uh, wired, but they, it isn't interfering with their ability to get their work done or study or take care of their kids or whatever their ordinary daily activities are. So usually we think of depression, bipolar disorder, uh, and is bipolar disorder a severe mania versus a more hypomanic period? Okay. Um, is there any data on 
in, in terms of the cycling, you said there's an oscillation between periods of hypomania, mania, and periods of depressed mood, dysthymia, or, or M MDD, major depressive disorder. But is there data, I mean, do they have people who um, just cycle concurrently? They just go up and down to these different uh, emotional extremes? Or do they have people who stay at a more regulated state um, for some time? Yeah, and what you're describing are different course patterns that we've seen in both unipolar and bipolar. A typical yeah. unipolar uh, pathway is to have a major episode and then a couple of years down the road have another one. There's about a 70% chance if you've had one depressive episode that you'll have another at some point in your life. And is that like a, a median interval, several years? Uh, the average is a couple of years, wow. but of course that that averages over a lot of people. There are people who have one, another one six months later. There are some people who have one ten years later. Okay. But we know that if someone has had one, the, the chances are better than 50% they'll have another one. Right. Now, with bipolar, it's almost certain that if you've had a manic episode, you'll have another manic episode. But the pattern of cycling really varies person to person. So, mm -hmm. for example, I'm glad that you guys watched that tape on bipolar depression because most people with bipolar spend their time depressed more than they do manic. The manic is the more dramatic uh, and the more media sensation oriented of the states, but really depressed. And is that because the, the body just sort of gets depleted? It can't sustain almost chemically that level of activation? It, it may be there, it, there are, we think, genetic patterns that have to do with the course of illness, about how much uh, neurotransmitter is produced at different stages of the disorder. It also depends upon how uh, compliant people are with their medications. Mm -hmm. uh, but there probably are genetic differences in course patterns. We haven't really identified what those are yet. Yeah, and we'll talk about some of the developmental aspects of it, because I know you've looked at child onset and adult onset, but does it have any similarity in terms of like addiction, for example, you know, one of the, the old axioms, the best treatment of uh, addiction is to get old, you know, to survive and get old, because it, it sometimes people just, uh, to stop, they stop, it just doesn't have the same allure if they survive. But what about um, untreated uh, manic depression, um, would it stop at some point? If you could survive? There are people who seem to get better as they get older. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the finding in schizophrenia is that about 30% of people have no more episodes after about age 50. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know who those people are. It's about the same for bipolar disorder. Uh, but it's tricky because sometimes they have milder depressions when they're older that mm. are part of the syndrome, but they're not quite as severe, partly because they're on medications. Right. We know that the worst part of the illness is usually when the person's in their early 20s. Right. That, that's when you see the most substance abuse, the least compliance with medication, and people can become so-called revolving door patients at that point. But for those people who go into, um, let's say, developmental remission, um, with these serious um, illnesses, have they, did they have any hypotheses about what happens naturally with the brain that would underpin the developmental remission as a clue for treatment? Yeah, I wish we had a good answer to that question. You know, there's the, there are theories about bipolar having to do with an overactive amygdala paired with an underactive prefrontal cortex, uh, which does seem to characterize the disorder at a certain stage. But interestingly, if you look at kids under the age of 10, their level of amygdala activity and their level of prefrontal cortical activity is positively correlated. But as soon as they get into uh, pubescence and adolescence, then you start seeing an inverse relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and we think that in bipolar disorder, uh, there's a uh, problem with tamping down amygdala inputs. So as you age, cortex. maybe the neurochemical activity in the amygdala is tamped down just That's developmentally. Probably, that may be. Uh, there are other hypotheses, like the dopamine system right. matures at age at 21, 22. The brain in general matures until about age 25 as right. an ADHD 
But, you know, those are all sort of post hoc explanations. I don't think we really know why some people do better when they're... But they would, they're post hoc, but they also could possibly allow for some experiment. For example, I, I don't know, see the problem would be that you can't do animal models of bipolar, right? No, you cannot. I mean, you can't you can slow try. down, you know, in other words, I was thinking that um, because it's a disorder of consciousness almost, which you can't really access, but although I, I imagine there are some behavioral aspects of mania, so if you were to take an animal and um, uh, through electrical stimulation inhibit the activity of the amygdala, not using chemical means, could you, do you see a behavioral slowdown that might generalize to you? I don't know that that's ever been done. Yeah. It's an interesting experiment. What well, has there been, you go. All right. What has been done is... Let's just uh, stop the interview right now. Let's, go to, let's get to work. Who, who wants to do this study? <laughs> well, Dr. Gilbert and I. Uh, the, what has been done is there's, there's quite a linkage with the circadian rhythm mm. system. We mm -hmm. know that bipolar disorder has a lot of dysregulation in sleep-wake cycles and when melatonin is produced, when people are going to bed. Uh, and one thing that has been done are the so-called uh, knockout gene studies where they knock out genes for circadian rhythm dysregulation right. and then look at do you see manic behavior and you do really you, you see more a hyperactive mouse basically right right but then you think well is hyperactivity the same as mania because mm -hmm. ADHD yeah. has hyperactivity too and you don't you can't really measure grandiosity in a mouse I guess you could <laughs> That's yes, right. Yeah, yeah. But there's also there's also the you know again that consciousness aspect of yeah. it that is very very hard. It, it hard has to be monitor. monitor, and you have to see it in some kind of writing production or verbal production. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. Or at least overactive behavior that cycles with underactive behavior. Right. We all know there are such things as hyperactive dogs. But we don't usually see ones that vary between hyperactive and underactive in, over periods of weeks. Right. So let's, let's talk about, um, we were sort of touching upon this, but some of the diagnostic complexities here. Um, one of the things that, that I was interested in, we talked about this a little bit, was how do you know, is there a way to distinguish or predict that somebody who, be, who has a unipolar depression is not... A, have a unipolar depressive disorder, but that is the beginning of a bipolar disorder. Are there markers a, for that? That's a very important question, especially because if we think someone has just a unipolar depression, it's very reasonable to try an antidepressant, like an SSRI, serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And we know that if a person is bipolar, it can send them upward in the sense of manic. Or, or isn't it isn't it not effective? Or it might not be effective. Or, or you can it might have, actually it might cause amp the, them up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, uh, ramp up. So is a response so, to medication a signal that you it, might be dealing with bipolar? It can be, but we don't like to diagnose it that way because okay. we don't know if the the medicines have are that specific to one disorder. Okay. So what we look for are first family history. If there's a family history of mania. That's usually a sign that you've got to be careful with using antidepressants. Sometimes with depression, there can be uh, hyperactive, elated types of symptoms. So uh, for an example is they're sad and ruminating and suicidal, but their thoughts are also going fast. Racing, yeah. That's a, a sign of uh, being at risk for bipolar disorder. So there's this, that symptom, what we, it's, it's, it's such a funny name, yeah. the uh, psychomotor retardation. So, yes. So in you can have psychomotor, psych, psychological activation with depression. That might be a signal. That might be a signal. The other thing that's been found is uh, uh, people who go on to a bipolar course can seem to change out of depression very quickly. Mm -hmm. So most people, when they get depressed, it takes weeks and weeks before they're back to normal, whereas with a bipolar person, it can be seemingly overnight that they right they're out of this depression and maybe it's because they're in a new relationship or something right but that's that's a sign of a cycling pattern okay so you can have a you might have mania first mm -hmm. now can you ever have mania but not have 
a uh, depressive cycle? Yeah, what we call unipolar mania. Yeah. It's rare, but it does happen. We think it's about 10 to 15 percent of the population of people with bipolar disorder. They're usually men. There's usually a drug abuse history that's been triggering the mania. And the big question we always ask is, has there been a depression that just didn't meet the, the full threshold? And? And sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. But there is a, there is a phenomenon called unipolar. Ten percent, yeah. And didn't you say um, when we were talking that of that ten percent, there are none that just go unipolar hypomania? Well, we wouldn't diagnose it as a disorder. Because but do you think that there are people actually who have episodes of hypomania with any duration or regularity yes, that fact, neither we have? Know, we know there are because we see them in kids. That's a, actually a risk factor for developing bipolar in kids is if they have a hypomanic course and then get back to normal. But it's hard to, to yeah. diagnose because you know, kids get hyper. Right, you know, right. At what point do you call it a disorder? You call it sugar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm interested in, in, in the adult onset of an adult that has a hypomanic, multiple hypomanic episodes that neither, that are not precursors to a manic episode nor to a, um, a bipolar disorder. We, there are such people. And you know, I think in the DSM, we've at various points called them uh, Type A personalities. Mm -hmm. um, but isn't that more temperamental as opposed to episodic? Yeah, but yeah. It, it, you could have a kind of episodic vulnerability. I'm asking these questions yeah. because I want to be that person. You want to be that person <laughs> <laughs> because we have the right medications for you. Yeah, right. Thank you. We're, you can mess with my amygdala if you yeah, want there you go. <laughs> uh, to get that because one of the one of the things that. Um, K. Jamison, you know, uh, has talked about is the seduction of hypomania, yes. and that some people go actually go off of their medication because they want to see if they can have the hypomanic episode, which is such a glorious experience, but not kick into uh, to full bone mania. Yes, and that, that's rare. Very, that's actually a very strong pull for going off one's medication. If yeah. someone's had that experience before, you want to regain it. Yeah. And uh, that's one way is to go off your medicines and hope it'll reoccur. Right. And then talk a little bit about the distinctions between bipolar 1 and bipolar 2. Okay. So bipolar 1, technically, you only have to have had a manic episode. If you've had one manic episode, it's enough to be called bipolar 1 by the DSM. Uh, actually, if you've had one mixed episode, meaning you're manic and depressed at the same time, which I'll describe if that's useful, that's also a criterion for a bipolar one, what we call bipolar mixed. Uh, for bipolar two, people go from depression to hypomania and back. And most of the time, people with bipolar two are depressed, but once in a while, they get these periods of being charged up and active, but again, without impairment. And uh, that making that distinction can be tricky at, t at times because you have to uh, refer to the person's memory of how uh, damaging it was yeah. and or the relative's memory about whether or not it really interfered with their functioning. When, but, I, when I was reading about this, some people were debating um, the diagnostic issues between bipolar 2 and uh, borderline personality disorder and some trauma reactions. It seemed very, very complicated to tease out the uh, bipolar 2 from some of these personality disturbances. That is true. It is very difficult, especially because the key symptom in borderline personality is mood instability. Exactly. Right? Explosiveness, rage, depression, suicidality, all of those things. And in fact, if a person is depressed, you really cannot distinguish a borderline personality depression from a bipolar depression. They look just right. alike. Right. What borderline people don't have are the manic symptoms. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't tend to see somebody being elated, uh, not sleeping. Their exaggerated affect would be more agitation, yes. anger, yeah. as opposed to uh, grandiosity or elation. Right. Right. You have to look for uh, four or five symptoms that go together. So elation, decreased need for sleep, mm -hmm. rapid speech, increased activity, increased energy, uh, plus, uh, you know, um, impulsive behavior in various 
forms. Okay, last uh, diagnostic question, then we'll move on to some treatment issues. Um, what about the whole controversy, the developmental controversy about diagnosing bipolar in adolescents when there's so much mood instability in this uh, developmental do you, do period? Do you want to talk about that as well as childhood? Because that's Sure. A, yeah. So there's been a lot of controversy about both, especially about childhood. And uh, uh, this started probably 30 years ago where suddenly in psychiatry, every kids were being diagnosed left and right as being bipolar when they were six, seven years old and hyperactive and acting probably ADHD-like, but also uh, hypersexual, for example, not sleeping regularly. It's rare to see a seven-year-old who only wants to sleep four hours a night. There are maybe some of you have babysat, no, there are such kids, but uh, it's unusual to see that on a regular basis. So there was an overdiagnosis of childhood bipolar disorder, and mainly in the United States. And we think that some of that was probably driven by drug companies who were trying to uh, sell drugs for younger kids. I think it's very different when you're talking about adolescents, because adolescents do become depressed in a major depressive way. They're at high risk for suicide, and you can see full manic episodes at age 14, 15, and 16. It's rarer than it is than an adult onset, but we're reasonably certain now that there is a syndrome that has an early onset of age 12 or 13. A little less clear with the younger kids. We think that there are prodromal forms of bipolar disorder in kids where it's not a full syndrome yet, but they're showing some of the early warning signs, grandiose thinking, um, some sexual inappropriate sexual thinking, decreased need for sleep, all these kinds of symptoms that don't quite meet criteria but are, are nevertheless a warning sign of something more to come. Also ADHD as it occurs in a seven or eight year old, I assume everybody knows ADHD, uh, attention deficit disorder, uh, can be a precursor of bipolar disorder because you have the activation, you have the rapidity of movement and impulsiveness and then the mood parts of it start appearing in adolescence, mm -hmm. when when adolescent when mood instability is sort of at its maximum. Okay, so let's move on to um, talking a little bit about treatment. And one of the things that we were talking about that I think would be interesting to to share is the type of treatment that a typical person uh, might receive for a bipolar disorder as opposed to some of the more privileged uh, forms of treatment. I think LMU is, uh, takes social justice issues very importantly, and I think that there are some access and social justice issues applied to the quality of treatment that's out there and available for people uh, in bipolar. I thought that was very interesting. Maybe you could speak to that. Yeah. So, the uh, the prob probably the most common outpatient treatment for someone with bipolar disorder once they've if they've been in the hospital at all we have an outpatient treatment that follows where their the goal is to stabilize them from whatever episode they just had and generally the what people get is medication they meet with a psychiatrist gives them mood stabilizers uh, antipsychotics. Um, anti-convulsant medications like uh, a Depakote is a pretty common one, or they get lithium, or they get Lamictal, or Lamotrigine. Uh, sometimes they get antidepressants. But it's not common in community mental health for people to also get psychotherapy. And actually, that's what our work is all about, is pairing psychotherapy with medication as a kind of optimal treatment plan. What, uh, there are different ways to craft psychotherapy, and this, of course, gets into your second part of your question about what's the optimal treatment. We think uh, the optimal treatment is a can good... I, can I just yeah, sure. in one second? In this more typical uh, treatment, would they at least get some uh, group therapy, some group support, or even that is not... That's not even guaranteed either. I think wow. if you go to a commu community mental health center USA, which could be funded very well or funded, and the ones in LA aren't bad. They actually have a reasonable funding stream here. But in other states, like where I lived for a long time, Colorado, uh, very poor funding for mental health care. 
uh, and there might be a group, but it might only meet you know, twice in six months. Uh, there might be lectures, there are groups they can go to, like the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill or the Press of Bipolar Support Alliance, but And is that not because the, the uh, quality of uh, providers is not there, or because of the fact that unless you have top drawer insurance, you're just going to get medication? That's, it's probably a little bit of both, but I think also uh, in terms of what is called the optimal treatment, that varies place to place. Like you, you probably remember that about 20 years ago, all of a sudden everybody started taking up EMDR right. for PTSD, even though the database on that was, was pretty weak on the whole. Yeah. So mental health, some mental health centers said, okay, from now on, anybody with PTSD gets medication and EMDR, or just EMDR. Mm -hmm. uh, bi with bipolar, I don't think mental health centers are there yet where they've said, Psychotherapy is so important that we have to make sure every person with bipolar disorder gets it. In interestingly, in England, there's now a, um, a parliament uh, uh, law that was passed about everybody gets CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, a minimum of eight sessions. Sometimes it's done by a bachelor's level person. Wow. Uh, but everybody's entitled to eight sessions of CBT. I don't know if that's a good idea or not. Right, right. So what about the more ideal or privileged therapy? So in the, pri in the privileged therapy, you would want to see somebody, first there should be some continuity between inpatient and outpatient care. So if they're in the hospital, whoever is their doctor should know about it and at least play some role in changing medications or recommending treatments. When they get out, there should be more frequent sessions of drug treatment and psychotherapy. And the, end, the psychotherapy can be individual, family, or group. There's mm -hmm. evidence for all three. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes family is best for younger people because parents are trying to make sense of what's happened or for young married couples where the spouse is going, what, what am I supposed to do? Is this gonna happen regularly? Uh, when people are in their 40s and 50s, sometimes they just want to see it go individually and try to figure out what it is that's triggering their episodes. And then one of the things we focus on in therapy is, do you know what your triggers are? Do you know what your early warning signs are? And is there anything you could do to prevent those right, from, right. from occurring? I mean, we're talking about this as privileged therapy, but it just seems like common sense It seems therapy. like common sense, yeah, but it... it shows up also in depression. We We're not talking about, you know, three times a week intensive psychotherapy for three years. We're talking about relatively brief therapy, yes, maybe with some boosters once in a while. I, I just don't understand why the insurance companies wouldn't fund this because the cost of a, um, a relapse, I would think, is far greater it is. than having these therapies. Yeah, and, so and why? an argument has been made, but in some community mental health centers, you have that problem of capitation, as they call it, where a community, the center gets X amount of dollars to treat For an everybody HMO kind of in model. the region. And yeah. so what they'll do is they'll pour the money into medication and medication management. If there's any left over, they'll use it for therapy, but it'll be, it'll be uh, um, you know, less generous. Okay, that's in a capitation model, but if a, if a person has individual insurance, does they, the individual insurance pay for these kinds of... Usually, usually they'll pay, I say, see. for 12 sessions uh, or 15 sessions maybe in a year, which may be sufficient. Right. Uh, most people don't want to be going in every week for a year or two, or two years. Right. But uh, generally the insurance will, will cover it, but not everybody has private insurance. So, for example, the larger number of people have Medi-Cal, Medicare, those, uh, I'm actually getting some experience with that right now, yeah. Medicare, the reimbursement rates are very low. If the insurance companies paid for the type of care, both pharmacology and uh, psychotherapy in a variety of forms, do the patients want that? I think 
Most of them do, assuming they haven't already been through a couple of rounds of it. If mm -hmm. you were to come to somebody and say, we think you would benefit from CBT, but they've already had three or four rounds right. of CBT, they're not going to be excited about that. It's kind of like physical therapy. If what, you hurt your back. Yeah. What about, um, what about the family-focused therapy that you're doing? Is there a demand for that that is not reimbursed? It seems like it would be such an important adjunct uh, to prevent not, relapse. We have not run into problems with reimbursement because it's a psychotherapy. We just write it down as a psychotherapy and nobody really has bothered us about whether it's family or individual. My understanding is there are some policies that really do think of family therapy as uh, the thing you do when you're having marital problems or right. you just can't get along with each other, with they, which they say is not a health problem. Mm -hmm. But uh, I have not run into that very much. Um, yeah, by the way, there's another dimension to this, which is that often there aren't the therapists at the community medical well, centers. Well, that's what I was just going to say. I mean, if, if the insurance companies are wise enough to support the family work and the patients would like the family work, then um, what would be the barrier? I mean, you have the data from your, your long-term work in this area. You have the insurance companies seeing the value both clinically and economically, uh, which is a driver, and you have the, the patient and certainly their family members would want this. So it seems like a perfect storm of support. So is the, the weakness, the lack of training um, in places other than sophisticated centers like SEMO or an area like Los That's Angeles? That's an interesting question. I, I would guess that it's partly the lack of practitioners, but it may also be lack of knowledge that this is even an option. I think in com uh, community mental health centers, they don't always know what the right treatments are, what the right. most evidence-based treatments are. They have their therapists who do this kind of therapy, and if they do CBT, they do pretty much the same thing with anybody, regardless yeah. of whether it's bipolar or not. But yeah, I'd say one of the barriers is the funding, the other is is, are there people there who know how to do it? Mm -hmm. We've got, come under some fire for that because, what do you mean? well, we've been told uh, you need to get out there and train more people. Right. And I can understand that argument. It's, it's a, a point well made, but you know we don't have the personnel to be going all over the country and doing workshops. We well, put together training online. Well, that's what I was just going to say. Training online, but the other one would be, you know. Um, if you have technology-mediated therapy, you can be, you can, if you have a concentration of therapists who have learned this method, why not uh, deliver it through online sources? I know there's HIPAA kinds of things and you have to be very, very careful about an interstate practice, but it seems to me if you have a rural area mm -hmm. which, you know, could profit from this, but they just don't have the trained personnel, that this would be a perfect application for technology-mediated uh, therapy. I'm glad to hear you say that. We actually did something like that in Colorado at the VA hospitals. Okay. Uh, there was the Denver VA was one of the few large VA hospitals in the region, but they had a lot of outpost clinics around the state. There were people who you know, lived 300 miles away. Yeah. Uh, so we were able to set up some Skype. Uh, therapy sessions where they would go to one of those outpost clinics and sit in a studio and we would treat them from Denver. I think there is a role for that kind of thing and I think the VA has really been ahead of the curve with those sorts of approaches. Yeah, or even contacting graduate programs around the country and um, saying if you don't have the practitioners to do this, that we could train your graduate students and then have the dissemination of the skills through the graduate programs. I mean, it's, a, if, it's certainly an underutilized uh, service so that you could have a young clinician who might have some foresight in terms of their career to really um, have a very active practice in a more um, uh, underserved area, mm -hmm. if they're willing to, to locate there. Mm -hmm.
Um, and it had yeah. to be somebody who I think really believes in the model yeah. and wants to make that their specialty. We, our experience so far has been that when we treat, when we do a training, there's usually a kind of a lead person who really wants to learn it and a couple people along for the ride. Right. And that lead person will train other people. Gotcha. Uh, gotcha. Train the trainer model. Yeah. Could you could you share with us the essence of the family focused sure. treatment that you and your colleagues have developed? Okay. So what this family focused treatment is again we're working with patients who are coming off of an episode, either adolescents or adults. So they are either manic or have recently been manic or they're depressed. And we bring in the family, which is either parents or siblings or grandparents, whoever they identify as being the family. And of course, when you think of there are racial and ethnic differences in terms of who's identified as the primary family member um, and SES differences, but we take whoever comes in, we try to get everybody in. Mm -hmm. um, the first stage is educating the family about what bipolar disorder is, but we do that through the patient telling their story. Mm -hmm. So what is a manic episode like? What's a depressive episode like? How do you know when you're getting manic? Turn to the bomb. How do you know when he's getting manic? What, what does he do that's so different? very personal rather than didactic? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's we good. started with a didactic approach right. and got rid of it pretty quickly because yeah. they were not interested in yeah. the electric yeah. tube. Yeah. So um, uh, the first part, and we try to get them to commit to a relapse prevention plan, which is listing what are the prodromal signs, what are you going to do if those appear, who's going to do what, who's going to call the doctor, and so forth so that we can uh, uh, try to prevent an episode. Is there, in the um, video we watched from the Stanford group, um, do you do incorporate any of these social rhythms, you know, sleep hygiene, exercise, diet? We do. We, uh, th those are good health habits, I think, no matter whether they, you're they, bipolar they, or not. They, but, yeah, know. of course, for, they're good for anyone, but it seemed to me to provide a kind of regulation Yes. in the environment, a structure. Yes, and yeah. that's especially useful, we find, with younger kids because you know, they have chaotic uh, sleep-wake times, and sometimes we can track that to uh, the chaos in the family. Uh, yeah. Nobody has the same bedtime. They don't eat dinner together. Nobody knows who's going to be home on what night, and some of that we can structure or help them structure. Right, right. So then as we go along, then we enter a communication skills phase where we're really more working, kind of like what you and Andy did with uh, communication skills training and right. uh, teaching people how to uh, listen, resolve and issues, resolve and conflicts, define problems, go through the steps of solving them. Yes. Uh, there is this construct, high expressed emotion, which we've found is, is it's high criticism, hostility, or overprotectiveness in a caregiver. And that predicts relapse. And that's a predictive yeah. relapse. We try to get at those dimensions with the communication training. Right. So, so it's a, about very, a 12 session treatment altogether. Yeah, sounds, uh, sounds very useful. I'm sure that the, uh, the group's going to want to ask you more questions about the treatment and about, about the disorder um, in general. But uh, maybe we'll end the interview part just to um, and you've worked in this area for several decades, you know, now. Um, what lessons, um, what, what's been the good and the bad of it? What lessons have you taken away from the study of uh, mood disorders? Sure. And all, did you want to talk at all about creativity also? The, um, or do you want to hold well, on that for now? Well, you were so interesting that we didn't, uh, <laughs> we went right over here. <laughs> but maybe we'll, we'll feather that into a question. Sure. Uh, what have I learned? Well, I think one thing I've definitely learned is that if you're a psychologist working in a field that's heavily psychiatric, which bipolar disorder is, the, the, it's the province of medicine. People, uh, the primary treatments are medical. So you really have to fight to establish your point of view in that setting. I've had to do quite a bit of fighting to say, look, psychotherapy is important and it should be part of the treatment plan. It's not just a question of getting on the right medicine, and every, and then everything will be fine. So one thing I think I've learned is to be assertive for patients about the importance of psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. uh, same with funding agencies, about, you know, this is a, a, this is a more holistic treatment plan. Um, 
yes, it, inc it includes basic health uh, maintenance, but it also includes some illness-specific strategies, uh, making it part of a graduate program or an internship program wherever possible. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the other thing is when you're with a very s severely mentally ill population, not to personalize it because you can, I mean, you're going to be personally touched by the patients you work with, but you can't get into self-blame that I should have been able to prevent that person from relapsing or I should have seen that coming. Sometimes you can't. Right. It's a powerful disorder. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, let's open it up here and uh, uh, get some questions from the audience here. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that's so good. She's a plan. She's a plan. She's a plan. <laughs> um, and, and Dave, when you get the question, when you feel the question, because uh, the question is not mic'd, if you can sort of uh, repeat it in a short form for the, for the taping and for the What's other your name? people. Oh, Veronica. Veronica. So Veronica's question is about creativity. Uh, I assume you mean what's the link between bipolar disorder and creativity? Yeah, and I was wondering in terms of, um, say, like, Mm -hmm. How does that work with like a bipolar patient? Would you recommend that or would I recommend really music? Um, I think anything that is that the person says stabilizes their mood and becomes a meditative uh, uh, trance-like technique. Music, uh, listening to waves crash, um, uh, even listening, just listening to a, a, a sound machine can be very therapeutic for some people. I think music is especially good because it has an emotional component to it. It's a way to calm oneself down. Um, but some people, you know, when they're manic, they really like to turn up the volume and listen to really hard driving music. That's okay, that's one way to, uh, I don't see any harm in it, certainly, whether it's going to do anything to prevent an episode, that I would doubt. Um, in terms of creativity, uh, we know there's a link that many uh, composers and writers and musicians have had bipolar disorder. Uh, Ernest Hemingway is an example. He uh, died of a gunshot wound to the head. Uh, he had alcoholism and bipolar disorder. Um, Tchaikovsky, uh, Beethoven, we think, had uh, bipolar disorder. Um, uh, Robert Lowell, the poet, there's a book that just came out about him. Um, uh, various musicians have said... I heard Handel, uh, Handel right? wrote The Messiah on a manic episode. Did you hear that? I've heard that. I, I don't think we know whether he actually wrote it then, right. but there's suspicions from just looking at the, the, uh, the course of the illness and what kind of energy level it took to write something like that. Yeah, and, and we do know that he wrote it in five days. So that's another. That's probably a, one of the greatest pieces of music ever written in five days. So. When I was in graduate school, Kay Jamison, who you mentioned earlier, yeah. wrote, uh, teamed up with the LA, LA Philharmonic and uh, put together a program called Moods and Music. And it was all about composers who had had bipolar disorder. And the LA Philharmonic played these pieces. And you could definitely hear the up and down movement of moods. Yeah, in, yeah. In the and, and speaking of Kay Jamison and, and creativity, she's written a lot and spoken a lot about this. And I was telling Dave that uh, she was the, an advisor to Claire Danes in the series Homeland mm. um, uh, because she works at uh, John Hopkins in Baltimore, which um, was close to where uh, Homeland was shot in D.C. And so I was asking him whether or not he felt that Claire Danes had a, uh, an accurate representation of bipolar, and you said? I thought, I thought that was pretty good said, as not, far as... You're not, uh, you're not being um, effusive here. No, no. I, you're I, not? I, I haven't seen anybody, I think, has really hit it on the head in terms of what it looks like, but, you know, for the camera, you've got to stretch them th some things. And you don't think it was the quality of the advising, like you could have done a better job than no, K.J. No, said? I, that, I thought that's where you were leading. <laughs> <laughs> no, not me. Okay, all right. Um, the uh, the uh, one thing, uh, last thing about that is that uh, there's a trap for clinicians here, which is that some patients will come in and say, I have a Tchaikovsky in, inside me waiting to come out. 
and if I keep taking this medicines, he'll never, he'll never come out. So I'm going to go off my medications, and I'm going to see if I can write music or write a, a novel. And I think uh, what often happens is they go off their medicines, and there's a big episode. Sometimes there's a suicide attempt, um, and it can be pretty ugly. Does does the uh, creative are the creative heights tamped down? Is that a cost? Yes, uh, the medicines do tamp down creative instinct. But the interesting thing is, uh, when bipolar people are most productive is during the hypomanic phases, not the manic phases. When they're manic, they kind of produce a lot of stuff, but not necessarily good stuff. Mm. During hypomania, they have just enough energy. So sometimes yeah, it's the a energy bargaining and the organization to yeah. channel it into something. Yeah, think outside the box and so on. But right, the, right. The, th the thing is, they have to kind of negotiate with their psychiatrist a, a lower dosage so they can have some hypomania. If Interesting. The, if, the med, if the MD is aware of this literature, they'll sometimes okay. do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Renee. I read somewhere that um, women with bipolar disorder experience more rapid cycling, like um, going from mania to depressive episodes. Does that make them easier to diagnose since they have more rapid cycling? Or that, that's a good question. Uh, Renee is asking about um, rapid cycling in women and whether or not that makes, uh, makes it easier to diagnose. And again, rapid cycling is this phenomenon, what we arbitrarily define it as four or more episodes in a year. So four episodes of depression, mania, or hypomania in a year. And it is more common, that cycling pattern is more common in women. But it can be very hard to tell that apart from other types of mood problems, like borderline personality. Because you can see the sort of explosiveness and sudden changes in mood. And if you're only looking for mood changes, it can look just like what you'd see in borderline personality. Uh, so if you're also seeing the sleep problems and all that, then we think it might be more bipolar. Well, interestingly, the theory was there's got to be something hormonal about that, right? And isn't that what always happens when a, a, something is found to be more common in women? It must be hormonal. That's what people thought for a long time, and guess what? There was no hormonal difference between people who did and didn't have rapid cycling. It's something else that's causing it, and I suspect some of it has to do with the fact that depression is more common in women than men, and the episodes are more common. Even if it didn't cause it, the, the uh, hormonal cycles, uh, when, when a woman was um, having her menstrual cycles and she is bipolar, Will that have an impact on the experience? Not as much as you'd think. Yeah. There are people who have worsening of mood during their periods. Right. And in fact, sometimes there are some docs out there who will give antidepressants at certain times of the month and not others. Um, that's not particularly recommended for bipolar disorder. But uh, the link with the menstrual cycle is not as, as strong as you'd think. There is some link actually with menopause. Mm. as we see some stabilizing of moods after menopause. Right, okay. right. Okay. Yes? Um, what signs or symptoms do you look for when you're diagnosing, kind of going back to the child thing, um, for, for someone who's bipolar versus comorbid ADHD? Okay, that's a good question. So uh, what, how do we distinguish ADHD and what kind of area, age of kid? Do you mean anything up to 12 or something? Yeah, well, earlier. Yeah. they have ADHD and they can be misdiagnosed or Right. Or so the, what the literature is showing on that, and by the way, there, was a lot of, there were a lot of opinions about this before anybody went out to test it. The, the finding was that um, uh, basically in both mania and ADHD, you could have hyperactivity, you could have increased uh, speech and rapidity of speech, and you could see impulsive behavior and loss of concentration that those were common to both conditions. And you couldn't distinguish them on that, nor could you on irritability, because irritability characterizes both. What does distinguish them is elated mood, grandiosity, decreased need for sleep, meaning that they can get away with four hours and feel just fine, and psychosis, so delusional thinking, hallucinations. We don't see that in ADHD. 
So it's really the manic and psychotic symptoms that distinguish them the most. Sometimes you have to look over time to really be sure because uh, if you look at two kids, they can look identical, but down the road, one of them looks more manic and one of them looks more ADHD. If you saw in, uh, in a child um, symptoms that made you think that there was a, a decent chance that they might have bipolar, they might express bipolar disorder later on, maybe family history, high expressed emotion, various uh, behavioral signs. Could you use the family focus treatment in order to uh, try to prevent the disorder? I'm glad you mentioned that because we just finished that study. We worked oh, good. on it for, it took almost six, seven years to do. We looked for kids who had a bipolar parent and who had early signs, depression, hypomania, and some of the things I've been mentioning and they either got family-focused treatment or a comparison treatment okay. of less intensive. What we're trying to look at now is who converts to the disorder. We know that it... Um, How that old it, were the kids? The you... kids were on average about 13 when they started. When they started. 13. And how long will be the post-test? How long, long you follow? Enough. Not long enough. We've been able to follow them for four years. So they're about 18. Uh, at the end of the follow -up. And ideally, how long would you like to follow? 25? Uh, yeah. 25 but would be a reasonable time. The end, of, the end of the brain development, yeah. maybe, would, yeah. be, would be interesting. People have done eight, nine year follow ups, and nobody's done a prevention trial that long. Yeah. I think what we're going to be able to say is that we can prevent depressive episodes, and that's what the data are looking at. Whether we can actually prevent the onset of full manic episodes, I think we'd need a longer follow up to really be able to do that. And is there any indication that the granting agencies might allow you that longer view? We'll see. We're, ask, we're asking them to. Well, okay, well, we're, we're rooting you on on that. <laughs> <laughs> Although that'll There's give you time to do the my amygdala study if you, <laughs> if you don't get the funding there. The, uh, the thing is, though, that the, you know, the kids have to want to do it, too, because right. you know, when they get to college and sure. they're saying, oh, I'm, I'm th done with that. You know, I haven't had any symptoms in a long time. I never thought I was bipolar in the first place. Um, and they You need a big not. grant and you offset some of the college costs, there right? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, my, the whole class will participate. Um, yep. Yes, go ahead, Lakin. Uh, we saw a video of Kay Jameson saying that bipolar is highly comorbid with alcohol abuse. So if that's happening, do you treat one or the other first or together? Great question. So uh, if you have comorbidity of alcoholism, bipolar disorder, or for that matter, drug abuse and, uh, and bipolar disorder, uh, which one do you treat first? And uh, there is about a 40% comorbidity rate with alcohol dependence or abuse between adult bipolar and alcoholism. Which we treat first really depends upon which, we, which presents first. So if we get somebody in the hospital who's clearly been drinking, but we think they might be bipolar as well, we're going to treat the alcohol first. We're going to detoxify them. We're going to try to get them into a, uh, either a 12-step program or motivational enhancement or something, try to get them uh, stabilized from the uh, substance abuse. And then we're going to see, do they still have bipolar disorder? Because we may have misdiagnosed that. They may have looked like they did because their mood was unstable because of the alcohol. Now, compare that to a, somebody who's been dry for six months and gets manic for reasons that have to do with having bipolar disorder. We're going to treat that person, of course, as a bipolar person and hope the alcoholism isn't going to return in the process. So it really depends upon what we're presented with. Marijuana is an interesting uh, situation because a lot of patients smoke marijuana regularly or use uh, CBD oil or something like that. Uh, we don't think it's particularly dangerous, uh, but it does make people not take their medicines. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the main thing. I had a number of uh, clients that I've worked with who feel that smoking weed has precipitated a manic episode. Oh, really? Is, that, is there any data I've on seen, that? I've seen that with psychosis, that people say that Actually, there's some yeah. evidence that it was paranoia a manic, It was a worse. manic episode, but there was a psychotic element yeah. to it. 
you know, because uh, in the anxiety states that can accompany uh, strong marijuana uh, can become paranoid-like delusions after a while. And if somebody has a vulnerability to psychosis, you can see that. I see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one more, and then we'll wrap up. Anything? We got everything? All right. Uh, Dave, it was a, a pleasure having you here. My pleasure. Your, your knowledge of this is just tremendous. Thank you. Thank you for having me.